Good morning, Cardinals players. Good morning, Cardinals parents. And I want to welcome you to our latest dugout session. We've got a really good guest today, uh, Darren Fenster, who's currently the minor league outfield and base running coordinator for the Boston Red Sox. Darren was kind enough to spend some time with us today. Um, before we start with Darren, um, we're still expecting June 22nd to be the day that we're allowed to start practicing. That's the date that we've been given by the governor, and we're still uh, hoping to do that. Fields are still to be determined. Towns have not yet opened them up yet, so we're still waiting to hear from that. With regard to your games, by now you should have had word from your coaches of the respected, respective age levels as to where and when you'll be starting those games. Uh, hopefully you've been checking out the training videos that we've been doing that have been up on our website and also our social media. If you are interested in getting lessons, the facility that we use during the winter DBAT down in Mountainside has opened up for some limited batting cage use and lessons as well. So if you, uh, if you want to check that out, you're more than welcome to do that. And with that, let's welcome Darren Fenster in. Let me share the screen for a second so you can get a little bit of a background on Darren here. This is our, uh, our sixth session. Darren went to Middletown High School South here in New Jersey, went to Rutgers, a two-time All-American shortstop. He's the Scarlet Knights all-time hit leader in career hits the single season hits leader and the career doubles leader as well for Rutgers. Captain of the Rutgers team, drafted by the Kansas City Royals in 2000. Is that right, Darren? Yep, yep. And then pl played five seasons in the Royals organization. Coached at Rutgers University, was also a coach in the Cape Cod League, the College Summer League. Named Coach Educator of the Year by USA Baseball in 2019. Darren's done a great job, especially on social media, with one of the things in Cardinals players who were on our first call. Darren, we actually stole one of your drills, and I posted them in the PowerPoint that I did, um, that you had your ST drills hashtag I use all the time. So if you guys remember that video that we posted back in our first dugout session, it came from Darren. He's been a coach and manager in the Boston Red Sox organization since 2012 and most recently was named minor league outfield and base running coordinator for the Red Sox. Darren, good morning and welcome. Hey, Jim. How's it going, man? And, you know, I appreciate you having me on. And just like, uh, you know, all, all your kids on here, I wish we didn't have time to do this. And I wish that we were all on a field doing what we love. But, you know, this is our... I guess it's our temporary reality and uh, you know, it's been, it's been good to do a lot of these to just kind of keep your baseball mind sharp and continue to, to learn more about the game and to help, uh, help others like the guys that you're, you're working with right now. Darren, what do you miss most about baseball? You know, one of the things that I really just love about the game and I don't know if other sports are like this, but there's a camaraderie amongst coaches, amongst players that, um, you know, I just truly enjoy being around the people that make up our organization. Um, and, you know, we have some great people that, you know, that help us do what we do. Um, they, you know, we push each other and, um, you know, that's, that's the fun part. And, you know, it's the one thing that I love the most about my playing career. It was that clubhouse camaraderie. It was the, you know, just being around with your buddies and, you know, playing is fun and, you know, working at it. I love and, but, uh, you know, it's really the, the people that make the, the job and the game what it is. For me, Ty Blankmeyer, we had him on as a guest last week. He said something very, very similar. It was that bonding of teammates and coaches that he misses the most. For me, it's uh, a bit more of the stuff that's on the outskirts of the game. It's the smell of pine tar. It's, it's batting practice. I, I, Darren, I can't tell you how many times I, I'll go to a game and just watch batting practice, especially when I was in college. Uh, up at Fordham, I'd sit in the rain and watch team the team practice. I mean, you know, though it was that type of thing. And again, maybe there's that bonding because there is a, a different type of relationship that players have with one another in practice than they do in the course of a game where your emotions get a little bit more of the better of you sometimes. Yeah, I, you know, I've always said that, like, you know, baseball players and baseball people, baseball lifers, I guess, is what, you know, you might consider me is like we're cut from a little bit of a different cloth, whether it be um, we're a good fit for the game or the game kind of shapes us where, um, you know, the, the, 
the nature of professional baseball, for example, where we're playing, uh, you know, 140 games on the minor league side, 162 on the major league side, we're together for six, seven, eight months, depending on, you know, what level you are at. So, you know, in many instances, you're spending more time with the guys that you're working with, the players that you're playing with, the teams that you're coaching than you are with your own family and friends. And that presents an opportunity to create a really, really strong bond like you know like Ty talked about and um, you know when you're in a situation like like I am fortunate to be in with the Red Sox where you know we we are a people-driven organization it makes for going into the ballpark and you know going to work I use in quotes you know it's it does not feel like a job in any essence and um, you know it's it, it makes going uh, going in uh, you know, a lot of fun every day. And, uh, you know, when at the end of the day, we're all pulling the rope in the same direction, trying to help our players and our organization get better. We have players of different age levels who are on the call right now and will be watching this later. And we start at about the age of 10 and go all the way through high school. And obviously there are adjustments that players make over the course of their career, whether it's little league to high school or high school to college. As you made the jump from the various levels in your career, Darren, what were some of the obstacles that you had to overcome to get to the next level and not just get there, but to stay there? Oh man, there, you know, there's, there's so many different directions that, that this answer could go in. But um, I, I would say that the most important thing is just being present to whatever you're doing in, you know, a day, in a practice, in a specific drill, in a specific rep. And um, I can honestly say like there were times in my playing career when I let things that were outside of my control affect the way that I, uh, I did the things that were within my control. So whether it be being upset about a role, whether or not I was playing or not, uh, whether or not I got drafted or not, um, you know, a, a, a multitude of things that it's very natural to like want to be an everyday player. And when you're not, you're upset about it. Uh, it's, it's natural that like when you're playing well professionally and you see other players get moved up that you get upset about it. Um, and it's, it's hard to, to compartmentalize that and not let it affect you. But with some perspective now, uh, you know, professionally, everything that I've been able to accomplish as a coach in this second life of the game is truly a direct byproduct of me just trying to be really good at whatever it is that I was doing at that time. So just to give you the example, like I started with the Red Sox in 2012 as a hitting coach in a ball. And I was just really excited about being a hitting coach in a ball. And I just tried to be a really good hitting coach in a ball without even thinking about managing. And, um, because I did the job that I did there, the organization saw some character traits in me that they felt like I would be a good fit to become a manager in rookie ball the following year. So I did that and I was really excited about being a manager in rookie ball and uh, just tried to do the best job that I could there. And a year later, I'm managing an A ball. Like I didn't manage in rookie ball hoping to be a manager in A ball the next year. I just did what I could. Um, and I took the same approach when I was in the South Atlantic League in Greenville and A ball and I was there for four years. So I went from being promoted after my first two years to, um, you know, being in the same spot for four years. And I got passed on for a promotion and after two years, which was, you know, which was fine. Um, and then uh, after my fourth year, um, I was then promoted to, to go to double A as a manager. And, you know, I'm excited about being at that level because now you're talking about a level where, guys could go straight from double A to the big leagues. And it's a little bit of a different animal than a ball. Um, and then, you know, a year later, I'm now uh, the outfield and base running coordinator where um, even the, the job was never anything that had crossed my mind before, because, you know, as, as you had alluded to previously, like my, my background is as a shortstop and it's as an infielder. And that's where my passion in the game lies. And, um, that's where my specialty was when it came to how we divided up uh, teaching on the, uh, you know, within our affiliates when I was managing. So um, the, the the most important thing, and I wish I had learned it earlier, and it's not an easy thing to learn, is just, you know, regardless of what's going on on the outside of, you know, your team or your situation, you know, you have an opportunity to try to just be really good at whatever it is that you're doing in that, 
that singular moment. And when you do that, you know, everything else has uh, a tendency of taking care of itself. How hard was the transition to go from playing to being that hitting instructor with the Red Sox? Once you so, I had, so I, I had six, six years in between when, when um, I went from playing um, – professionally to getting hurt to then I had a six year period when I was at Rutgers and then I went to the Red Sox um, as that hitting coach. So uh, when coach Hill brought me on in uh, 2006, like it was, it was not an easy transition because I never wanted to be a coach. Uh, Even while I was coaching, I think for a, a good chunk of time, months, maybe a year. I don't know. I still felt like I was a player and I still wanted to be a big leaguer, but I wasn't playing. Um, so, so that transition wasn't something that happened overnight. And it was something that, uh, I think really took some time to move on to because I wasn't like, I got blindsided when my career ended, I wasn't ready for it to end. Uh, and it just, it, it kind of just happened. And, um, I think slowly, but surely I kind of, took to the coaching profession and realized that, um, you know, I wasn't going to be a big leaguer and I, you know, I, I wasn't a player anymore and I had to transform my mind in terms of, you know, just how I was approaching my days, uh, you know, first at Rutgers. And then as, as you know, my time at Rutgers went about, I had some experiences coaching in the summer, like you talked about, uh, which helped me take on a bigger role at Rutgers, which set me up for moving on to the Red Sox in 2012. When you moved from being, you know, an infielder and you've been managing and coaching in the Red Sox system and they approach you about this outfield coordinating job, what were your thoughts then? Like, wow, I've never played outfield or I haven't played outfield since Little League or? Well, I, I, so it's funny you ask that because I, I literally think the first thing that I had said to my boss after he asked me that, uh, if I, you know, about the opportunity, I said, I'm like, hey, like, you, you do know I'm an infield guy, right? And, um, you know, it was half joking, but, um, you know, he then pulls up, he's like, well, you do know that you played, um, eight games of error free baseball in 2004 in the outfield. So that certifies you as an expert. Uh, so we <laughs> laughed about it, but like, he made a good point in the sense that like, I had proved myself in the seven years prior at that point, um, with the way that I went about my business in the various, I guess you would say one four different roles that I had had in those seven years. And even though the outfield stuff wasn't necessarily my area of expertise, they knew if I were to take it on, how I would dive into it. And they presented it to me in, in the light of being a challenge as well to help me become more well-rounded as uh, you know, as a baseball coach, because, you know, everybody I think has uh you know, a, a title that they put on themselves. Like, you know, if you want to say like, Hey, I consider myself a hitting guy or a pitching guy. Uh, and this is something that has helped me just become a more complete baseball guy. Um, and I dove into it in the same way I've, I've, you know, dove into everything else and, uh, very, very fortunate that they saw that trait in me that would enable me to do this. And, uh, you know, I've really enjoyed, uh, trying to build a culture on the outfield stuff and the base running stuff over the last you know year plus. And, you know, was really looking forward to building on the foundation we set last year. Uh, but then we, you know, the world kind of slammed the brakes on that and hit the pause button. So here we are. One of the reasons I've been asking about transitioning and then the comfort level of being an infielder and going to outfield. And I know this as a coach myself when I deal with certain players, but players, we get an attitude that, well, I'm an infielder or, I'm an outfielder and a coach will say, well, I'd like you to try this. And you know, you're challenging a player at some time, at some point in his career to do that. But even as a coach, and I know there's some parents on the call, I know that I'll look at a kid and think, well, I'm not an outfielder because he doesn't run well. I don't know where else I can put him because I got a better kid at first and he's really not a shortstop. How would you approach that type of thing? What would, advice would you give to a coach or a parent when dealing with a kid who says, hey, coach, I would like to play this position. And we have that stereotype in our head of what that position should look like. What would your advice be to that parent or coach, Darren? I would say even players or coaches, like the more things that you could do, the better. The more options you're giving, your, whether it be your coach or you know your boss, uh, as different ways to use you and fit, fit into the organization. And one of the examples that I always – like to use 
is, you know, if you were a shortstop coming up with the Yankees from 1996 to 2000 and, I don't know, 14, you weren't playing shortstop in the big leagues because they had Derek Jeter there. So if you were just going to say, well, no, I'm a shortstop, well, then, you know, you were either going to get released or you were going to get traded. Um, but if you wanted to play for the Yankees, which, you know, any professional player would want to play for the Yankees, um, you say, hey, like, you know what, like Derek Jeter is our shortstop. So I need to, I need to find a different place where I could bring value to the organization. Um, and uh, I think for a long time, uh, there was this stigma about players, you know, having a stranglehold on a position, uh, pitchers saying, Hey, I'm only a starting pitcher. And I think the, in the last three or four years, if you look at a guy like a Ben Zobrist, um, who's become an all-star as a utility player. I mean, Chris Bryant, you know, he'll play third base and then he'll play, you know, Joe Madden threw him out in the outfield. Um, pitchers, you have guys who have clothes that are now in like an opening role. Um, you know, and if, if you followed the Red Sox in the, uh, in the World Series in uh, 2018, Rick Porcello was a huge part of our bullpen. Uh, in us winning a World Series. So um, I, I truly believe that, you know, you work on your skills and as those skills get better, they will allow you to be put in different spots on the field uh, because you never know what the makeup of your team is going to be like. And, you know, a coach's job in most instances is to put the best nine guys out there. And, uh, you know, if if you happen to be, better as a secondary position than somebody is with their primary, well, then you're just giving yourself an opportunity to, to get, to get more experience. And, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of versatility and, uh, you know, it just, it just allows, you know, more opportunities for you to, 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 to do different things in the game. You mentioned the, the Jeter and that period of time where if you were in the Yankee system and being a shortstop, was that sort of what happened with Mookie Betts? where he came up as a second baseman and the next thing he knows he's in the outfield? Um, that's a, that's a good question. So um, I was just telling this story the other day that, you know, Mookie Betts is a gold glove winning MVP right fielder for the Red Sox and now for the Dodgers, unfortunately, but the first time he ever played right field in his entire career in his entire life was in Yankee stadium on his major league debut which speaks volumes to, you know, his athletic ability and, you know, what he was able to do. Um, but professionally, a lot of times guys are going to move because of their bat. When a guy proves that they could be an offensive force and, you know, help a lineup out, help a team score more runs, generally speaking, like they're going to find a place for, uh, for guys to play. And when Mookie came up, Obviously, Dustin Pedroia was kind of the Derek Jeter of the Red Sox, and um, he had established himself as an MVP, you know, as an all-star caliber player, and it was only just in the last few years where he's gotten hurt, and he hasn't been able to do that. So because of Mookie's athleticism, uh, the, the organization identified that he might have the athletic ability to move to the outfield. So, you know, I think he, he had a handful of games. I don't know the exact number. Once he got to double A, um, we started transitioning him uh, into a center, a center fielder, but he was still playing second base at the time. Uh, during batting practice, he would work out in the outfield. And then once the opportunity came, like he was an outfielder. And, and I think he's, he only has a handful of games at second base you know, in the big leagues. And I, I can't imagine that he's going to ever go back on the infield dirt just because of what he's able to do in the outfield. I know that a lot of teams, I see this now at the major league level where you see guys who are able to play all three outfield positions and you see guys going being like a Brock Holt type of player who's just this super utility player who can literally play everywhere in the field. Are you seeing more of that coming up through the minor leagues in various organizations, that type of player who can, as you just said, play pretty much anywhere? Yeah, some do that. The Rockies, for example, uh, I think they do a great job. I just remembered in, in A-ball, you know, they would have their infielders. One day they would play third base. The next day they're starting at short. The next day they're starting at second base. And, um, 
you know, I think in that instance, in A-ball, I think it could get pretty ugly at times. But by the time that guy gets a double A or triple A, now they have a couple years of experience playing multiple positions so that they're putting themselves in, uh, in, a, in a spot where if something opens up at not just one position but at multiple positions, guys aren't going to be scared because it's the first time they've, they've had to go there. And, you know, our approach is a little bit different. Like we want guys to really set a foundation – at a certain position for his first year or two. And then once they're comfortable, then we kind of expose them to a few different spots, whether that's a center fielder moving out off to the corners or an infielder starting to bounce around. Um, you know, uh, generally speaking, I think most teams have some kind of an approach of uh, getting guys at different spots. If in that event, you know, that's where their opportunity in the major league level is going to be. And that can be scaled down to, college the college game the high school game and you know so for for some of the younger kids on here who might not even be in high school yet you know if you're a shortstop go on to the second base side just so that you know you start getting used to the different angles that um that the ball is hit at like fielding a ground ball is identically the same but the you know the visual of being on the right side of the infield is is a little a little bit different it takes some getting used to one of the things that we've talked about with this versatility and, and expanding what you do and, um, and trying to build on different skills that you have, you played for legendary Fred Hill at Rutgers. Um, my first experience with Coach Hill, I think it was probably would have been your senior year. I was at a pitching seminar that he was a guest at, and I didn't know who he was at the time. I knew his name, but I, I didn't connect the face. All I saw was this man asking questions and I could tell based on the vocabulary that he was using that he knew what he was talking about but the way he was phrasing these questions Darren was and when I discovered that it was coach Hill I'm thinking oh my gosh here's a guy at the top of the division one game one of the most respected coaches in the country and he's still trying to learn he's still trying to gather more information and whether you're 10 years old or a division one coach or a player in the major leagues or a coach, I think that's super important is just keep building and never stop learning. Yeah. And that's one thing that I always loved about coach Hill. And, um, you know, I like to tell this story is that, uh, after I left, um, so he, he probably was, was a coach before he retired, probably maybe three or three years, um, while I was coaching with the Red Sox and, you know, I, had a great relationship with him and he was like a second father to me. So obviously I stayed in touch with him after I left. And one thing that was a staple of every single conversation that we ever had was he would always be asking, Hey, you know, what, what are some of the things that you're doing that we do? What are some of the things that <clears throat> you're doing that we could do that would help us? Um, and he was just someone who loved the game, who loved talking shop and uh, you know, whether or not he changed what his staples were, you know, he's, you know, was in, in a lot of ways, an old dog who you couldn't teach new tricks to, but um, I think, you know, his, his yearning for uh, just, you know, seeing what other people were doing uh, combined with his love for the game, I think was, a, was one of the reasons why he was able to have the, uh, the amount of success that he was over the course of his career and his life. As we mentioned at the top of the call, we expect our Cardinals players to be able to get back on a field somewhere on June 22nd. What are you hearing in terms of Major League Baseball, Darren? Anything that you're hearing up through the pipeline? Huh. Um, you know what? Like, with the way that um, the negotiations have have played out in, in public, there's really nothing that we've heard, and we have weekly calls with various departments. Um, there's nothing that has been broken in those calls that we're not hearing in public because – you know, that's how the media is kind of portraying it. So, uh, you know, we all want baseball to come back. And, you know, I was, you know, optimistic, you know, a couple of days ago when uh, Commissioner Manfred said that, you know, there will be baseball this year. Um, you know, I just, you know, I, I think the way that it's shaping out, you know, we, we may be stuck with just a season of, you know, 50 games or whatever that may be. Um, and, you know, as, as, much as we would love to have more than that. And I would love to have 80 game season. And, you know, if you extend it into October and played in, into November, you know, that, that would be, that would be ideal, but um, you know, 50 games or whatever it is that they do uh, is, uh, 
you know, I think better than better than a complete completely lost season. So once uh, hopefully hopefully they could come together here sooner rather than later because the sooner they agree, then that means the more games that they're going to be able to play. You can find Darren Fenster on Twitter at Coach Your Kids, and I urge you to check out the hashtag ST Drills. Uh, it's a it's a great series that you do every year, and there's I've, I've stolen so many of the drills that you've that you've posted there. And for any of our Cardinals players, when we've done our hitting stuff, if you've heard me say I want you to hit the ball to the back of the cage, I got that from Darren a few years ago. It was one of the things that I changed with the way I was doing hitting lessons was to concentrate on that, getting some drive towards the back of the cage, and it made a huge difference, Darren. I can tell you in the progress that kids were making in drills, just working off the tee and, and soft, soft toss and front toss. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you again for your time. Cardinals players, parents will have another uh, drill video up in a couple of days, and hopefully we're back on the field sooner rather than later.